Although the combination of the Olympus EM1 Mark II and the 12-100 Pro lens is a little heavy and bulky, it is the ideal kit for a landscape or architecture travel shoot. A f4 maximum aperture might at first appear a little restrictive for low-light photography, but it is constant throughout the 8.5 times zoom range, and the lens has its own image stabilizer that functions in conjunction with the camera's stabilizer. Therefore, armed with this basic kit, if you can call it that, I set off by public transport to Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. The camera carried in a rucksack for security, not advertising its presence whilst on the move. I went by train because upon checking the website, Blenheim Palace were offering a 30% discount for visitors coming by public transport. Also, photography was allowed inside the palace, but no tripods, flash or selfie sticks, which was a disappointment. A bus pass in addition to my rail card came in handy, as the nearest stations were Oxford or Hanborough. Going in April following a long, hard winter was beneficial. At first, not too many people about, but later several school parties turned up. But my crystal ball, not to mention the fates, had told me to do the palace tour first. Furthermore, as if to thwart my noble intentions, the moment I paid my entry fee, it clouded over. I didn't hesitate to enter, encouraged now by the softer lighting being more favourable for interiors and hoping that later the sun will make an appearance for the garden and grounds. This was a bit inconvenient because the reason for going was Capability Brown, whose landscape garden is one of his most celebrated creations. However, whilst at Blenheim, you might as well do the lot, especially at a discount price. I used the camera on program, which might raise a few eyebrows, but it is different to auto because you can key in other settings. Mine included 400 ISO for the interiors, spot metering, a minus EV compensation and white balance on daylight, which can be adjusted later in Adobe Lightroom. On program, because of low light, the camera defaults to f4, adjusting only to 5.6 in stronger light, but still with a comfortable range of shutter speeds from a sixth of a second to an eightieth for hand holding. At full aperture, Depth of field is not so much a problem as one might think. Probably it is closer to f8 on full frame. The wide angle limit of the 12 to 100 lens increases depth of field, but this can be boosted by detaching autofocus and focusing at about one third into the scene, probably around 50 feet. This is known as the hyperfocal distance, increasing depth of field, which extends twice as much behind the point of focus as in front, whereas autofocus by default will probably focus on the background, thus reducing depth of field. Underexposing as much as a whole stop with EV control was used to contain highlights, which even indoors the difference can be as much as several stops from shadows. Too much for any camera to handle without help, so forget auto and JPEGs. The photographer has to strike a balance between the imperfections of noise and burnt out highlights that are beyond recovery. I prefer a bit of noise to the latter. 
Direct sunlight makes the problem worse, even impossible. Therefore, my decision to photograph indoors on a cloudy day made controlling contrast easier. I am ruling out HDR or bracketing, as you need a tripod to keep everything in register. The acid test is an interior having a window in the background, which even on a dull day is much brighter. Without control, it will be grossly overexposed. Therefore, using a bit of guesswork based on experience, I underexposed the shot by spot metering, aided, of course, by the electronic finder to give recovery of the window highlight a bit of a chance. Adobe Lightroom will restore slightly burnt out highlights, but improving underexposure does require care as excessive lightening creates noise. Like so much in photography, compromise is often the answer, the judge being your eyes, and not a lot of empty numbers where theory says you can't, but practice says you can. Don't allow science to overwhelm your art. Stepping outside, things were a bit easier, but contrast remains a problem under a bright sky. It is still easy to burn out clouds, but now the amount of EV compensation is no more than minus two-thirds of a stop. Therefore, noise is unlikely to raise its ugly head. Controlling exposure as well as white balance gives colour a bit of oomph. However, I reverted to 200 ISO and spot metered near a highlight. I never trust matrix. Only my eyes know which part of the picture is best for colour and light intensity, and not something designed just for instant gratification. I also adjust outdoor pictures in Lightroom, and use Photoshop to create converging verticals in buildings. I do not use filters, because you are locked into them. With Lightroom, I can change my mind. And anyway, apart from protection, for which a lens hood is just as useful, I don't understand why I should put a filter in front of a lens costing £1,200 designed for the Olympus system. Photo technology does not work without timing. Stately homes and palaces attract people to these honeypots, and it is certainly a hidden art to get a shot without humans. At Blenheim, the main façade faces the great courtyard, giving public access to the palace and the gardens. But around 5pm, the visitors melt away, and that is the magic hour before closing, when the patient photographer gets the shot. Much of my work is achieved by treading an own path. Less is more is a well-used expression associated with composition. I extend it to gear. Whilst I embrace technology, it does not rule me, and very often my working methods are based on traditional techniques learnt over 50 years ago. However, Technology sometimes conceals traditional expertise that are still the best answer.